Hello again and welcome to our September edition of Quick Kit. Links to everything we mentioned will be down in the description below. This month has been absolutely jam-packed with kit, so grab a drink and let's get into it. First off, the biggest announcement has to be Red's new V-Raptor 8K VV. This camera looks to be a serious little beast. We actually have our Stormtrooper demo unit in the office now, and we are working on our full review, which should be out in October at some point. In the meantime, a quick TLDR. The Raptor features a newly developed 8K full frame sensor, which has a rated 17 plus stops of dynamic range. The ability to capture 8K up to 120 frames per second, 6K Super 35 up to 198, 4K up to 240, and 2K up to 480 frames per second. These are some seriously impressive frame rates, as they are essentially double what the Monstro could do and at pretty much half the cost. If the sensor performance is anywhere near that of Monstro, Red will be onto a winner here. This looks to be only the first iteration of the V-Raptor as well, with Red also showing us drawings for the XL version, which would be more akin to DSMC2 and Ranger from the last series of Red cameras. We'll be going over everything in our upcoming review, so make sure you are subscribed for our full review coming up soon, and let us know if you want to see anything specific in the comments below. Aperture have been really busy recently, and this month have announced two new fixtures, the Nova P600C and the LS1200D Pro. Let's start off with the Nova P600C. This is a new, larger version of the Nova P300C that was announced in summer of 2020. This new, larger fixture looks to compete with other lights, such as the larger ARRI sky panels, as well as the light panels Gemini 2x1. Though the original P300C did pack a punch for its size, but this fixture will definitely kick out more light. Specs wise, on paper, it does look very impressive, but we do want to test it ourselves before formulating a full opinion. However, the most intriguing feature has to be the ability to control four different zones of the fixture independently. This could potentially make for some interesting lighting effects in certain scenarios. I'm really intrigued to see what people can create with this. The second fixture was the 1200D Pro, which looks to bring a whole new level of output to Aperture's line of fixtures. Out of the box, the 1200D Pro comes with three different Bowens mount reflectors, a wide, medium and narrow, which will change the beam angle of the fixture. One nice detail is that Aperture have actually included a much longer 7.5 meter head cable with the 1200D Pro, which is much longer than their previous fixtures shipped with, and it will make it far better for gaffers wanting to get it into a more unique position on set. When it comes to output, the numbers the 1200D Pro can produce on paper look incredible for an LED fixture, with it in theory kicking out 83,100 lux at 3 meters with the narrow reflector, and 9,610 at three meters with the widest one. Other than its promised performance, it looks to feature an improved level of build quality and the same thoughtful feature set of previous Aperture fixtures. I'm super excited to get one into the studio to run through some tests with it. Another September and another version of the iPhone has been announced by Apple, and this consists of the 13, 13 mini, 13 Pro, and 13 Pro Max. And while on the surface, these may look to be incremental changes to the 12, they actually bring some really interesting features when it comes to recording video. While some of the updates have come to the 13, we'll be mainly talking about the Pro here. The 13 Pro features an updated sensor with a new sensor stabilization system, as well as an updated set of optics which improve over the previous generation. It also features the same LiDAR system that was first released on the iPad Pro 2020. However, the biggest new addition is the cinematic mode, which makes use of all of the updated and existing tech to give the recorded video depth of field that really isn't possible with such a small sensor. Think of it as essentially portrait mode, but for video. Basically, the phone is software emulating depth of field. This results in some shots that work really well and some that have artifacts of the effect not quite working right, which you can see with some of the example footage online at the moment. Currently, the cinematic mode is limited to 1080 30 frames per second, which will be a bit frustrating for those wanting to shoot in 24 frames per second. Overall, it's a great addition that I think will only get better in time. ProRes will also be coming to the 13 Pro and Pro Max. This is pretty awesome, and while Apple hasn't stated what flavour of ProRes this will be, just them doing it is a step in the right direction to give people the option to shoot better video on their phones. However, it really is a shame that Apple decided to keep the lightning connector on these devices. It's 2021, and these devices should really have a USB-C port by now. Wire transfer via this horrendous lightning port will take forever, so AirDrop will be the only viable way to dump footage, and even then, that isn't a perfect system for files that are going to be this large. In my opinion, these updates are a clear sign of things to come. The implementation of the software is still new, and you can see that from some of the examples. 
especially when you really pixel peep or blow the image up on a large screen. However, for the untrained eye viewing the footage on a phone, the results can look great and this is only going to get better and better and better. We've already seen the impact smartphones have made on the point and shoot and lower end video and stills camera market. And over the next few years, I think Apple, as well as other hardware and software developers, will keep pushing this tech to the point that this area of the market will be even more affected than it is already. It's exciting to see these types of developments and for budding filmmakers having the ability to tell a story using the phone in your pocket with this level of image quality is pretty incredible. Tilter's new Mirage matte box is their latest lightweight system capable of using a 95mm circular filter and a standard 4x5.65 filter, as well as the ability to control a variable ND wirelessly, which is its killer feature. Tilter will be offering a 9-stop variable ND which will range from 0.3 to 2.7 which can be used with a new tiny little motor that needs to be attached to the filter tray system. This can be powered via a battery or via micro USB. Tilter has partnered with Vaxis to create this very ND, as well as a range of 95mm filters for this system. This will include a range of NDs as well as some creative filters. Tilter has also created a new small wireless control unit for this system, but you'll be able to use the Nucleus M or N hand units as well, which will be great for existing Tilter ecosystem users. You'll also be able to attach the variable ND in a very stripped down configuration, which will be great for camera configurations when keeping weight down is really key. It's also priced pretty well, considering just how fully featured it is. This will either come with or without the variable ND system, depending on what you need. Just bear in mind that this system will not allow for the use of side flags, which may be a deal breaker for some. We released a video recently that went over everything you need to understand before buying or renting a map box, which is definitely worth checking out if you haven't and are interested in this new tilter system. Canon launched their flagship mirrorless camera, the R3, earlier this month with two new RF lenses, the 16mm f2.8 STM and the 100-400 f5.6-8 IS USM. We managed to get a few hours of the R3 before its release and create our first in-depth look, which you can check out via the link in the description below. Long story short, it's a hell of a stills camera and could be a pretty unique video tool as a hybrid camera, but we didn't get a chance to fully test it, which fingers crossed we should do soon. GoPro announced their Hero 10 Black, which is their latest flagship action camera. We still sell plenty of GoPros and the Hero 10 Black seems to upgrade plenty from the previous Hero 9, which came out this time last year. The Hero 10 can record 5.3K up to 60p and 4K up to 120 frames per second. It features a new GP2 processor, version 4.0 of GoPro's hypersmooth stabilization and the ability to live stream directly from the camera in 1080p, which could be really awesome for some content creators, especially with the front facing screen, which will make composing yourself much easier. Otherwise, it features a very similar set of functions to the Hero 9, but with a few improvements. Let us know if you think action cameras are still relevant and if you use them at all, let us know what for down in the comments below. There have actually been quite a few lenses announced this month, so let's start off looking at Atlas's new announcement. Atlas initially showed their Orion 25mm T2 anamorphic back in 2019, but earlier this month they have finally fully announced it, with pre-orders also now opening up. This now means the Orion series consists of 7 focal lengths in its set, and the 25mm will provide a really awesome wide field of view, which Atlas really showed well in their promotional video that they shared. It looks like a really awesome lens and a great addition to the already pretty fleshed out focal lengths available in the Orion set. It will feature the same 31mm image circle and a pretty close weight and size to the other lenses. It also has a pretty great close focus of 46cm, which I'm sure will result in some really nice compositions. We've reached out to Atlas to try and get a demo unit ASAP, so expect a review as soon as we get a hold of a demo lens. The Dieselow Vespid series of cinema lenses have been a pretty popular set of affordable full frame cine primes, however the widest focal length that release was only 25mm which on full frame will give you a wide enough field of view, but for some, not quite wide enough. And that's why DZO has announced a 16mm T2.8 for the set. 16mm on full frame will be plenty wide for most. The lens will cover the same 46.5 image circle as the rest of the set, and now brings the Vespid series to eight focal lengths, which makes it a pretty well-rounded set of lenses. We reviewed them back in December last year, so make sure to check out our review if you want to see how the other focal lengths perform. Mica has been gradually releasing more and more planned focal lengths of their full frame and Super 35 sets of cinema lenses over the past year, and their latest to finally hit the market is the 24mm T2.1 for their full frame line. This is the fourth to be released in this series and is the widest currently available. 
It fits in with the rest of their current lenses when it comes to image circle and general design. We looked at the 15mm last year and really liked its performance, especially given its price point. This new focal length now means you have a 24, 35, 50 and 85mm available to buy now. And this is a pretty well-rounded set of focal lengths if you are in the market for a Cine Prime set right now. The 105 is aimed to be released in November and the 16 and the 135 are aimed to launch in February next year. We should be getting some more micro lenses into test soon, so make sure you're subscribed to catch our reviews when they come out. Siri have been causing a stir with their affordable anamorphics for a while now, and they now have their sights on the full frame crowd with the announcement of an Indiegogo for a new 50mm T2.8 1.6x anamorphic lens. This will be available in RF, L, E and Z mount, feature a 0.75m close focusing distance, and is currently priced at $1,199 which makes it incredibly affordable when compared to other full frame anamorphic options on the market currently. I'm super intrigued to test this one out though. Chiops is a new brand in the cinema lens space and their first lens looks pretty great. The Extrema Compact Zoom is a full frame 28-85 T3.2. This actually looks fairly compact considering its 46mm image circle, focal range and maximum aperture. It will come in a range of mounts, has 11 iris blades and a front diameter of 114mm. I'm really looking forward to testing this one as it could be a really solid option for the massive range of full frame cameras now on the market, especially with Cheop saying that pricing should be on the more affordable side, when currently there isn't many full frame options like this that exist on the market. Earlier this month, Sigma announced two new lenses in their line of lenses designed for mirrorless cameras, the 24mm f2 DGDN Contemporary and the 90mm f2.8 DGDN Contemporary. Both of these are available in Sony E or L mount will cover full frame sensors and are aimed at being a nice balance between performance and size. They both fall into Sigma's I series of lenses, which now consists of six different lenses in the set. These look like really nice little primes for owners of the A7S III or S1H, as they feature solid performance, a compact design, and really nice manual controls. Right, let's get into our quick fire honorable mentions. Links to the details about these are in the description below. Corswix has announced the 147 watt hour nano micro 150 battery and the Maverick MV6, which is a 605 watt hour block battery. Shape introduced two new map boxes, one clip on and one swing away. Roland introduced the Aero caster switcher for iPads and the VO2 HD Mark II streaming video mixer. Lauer announced the Argus 33mm f0.95 CF APO lens, which is designed for APS-C sized sensors. DJI released the Osmo Mobile 5. Irex announced the 30mm T1.5 Cine lens, which now means they have five focal lengths in their cinema lens lineup. Manfrotto announced two new monopods. Panasonic has released another focal length in their affordable Lumix S line of L mount lenses, the 24mm f1.8. Zcam has released the Ipman Gemini and the Ipman Gemini Pro. Axion announced their power cage for iPads and the M1, which allows you to use an Android phone as a HDMI monitor. Prograde has announced a 160GB CF Express Type A card. PDMovi has released the Live Air 2S, which has a tiny little follow focus hand wheel. Cinema devices have introduced the Ergo Rig Center Fit, which has been designed specifically for female camera operators. Teradek has launched the 1500TX and 1500RX Bolt 4K monitor modules. Fujifilm has announced the GFX 50S Mark II, the XT30, as well as two lenses a 23mm f1.4 and a 33mm f1.4 XF. They also announced B-Roll for the GFX100 and 100S. Smallrig has announced a lavalier microphone aimed at the entry level market and Flanders Scientific have announced a new 24 inch display, the BM241. If you enjoyed this, please make sure you subscribe ready for next month's quick kit and let us know what kit you've picked up this month in the comments below. And thank you so much for watching.